Shalom, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, on another episode of Crossing Boundaries. Um, my name is Kim Pastor Yosef. I'm le uh, streaming live to you from Tel Aviv, Israel, and together with me is one of our amazing uh, co-founders, Aziz Abustera. Um, we're continuing our series about minorities and diversity, uh, diverse communities in the Middle East. Uh, we're diving deep today into uh, the immigration waves, the Jewish immigration waves coming into Israel from uh, the surrounding Arab countries. And uh, Shai Goren, hi Shai. Say hi. Hello. <laughs> uh, one of our guides is going to give us a brief background, a little bit of history so that we have a better picture before we continue and discuss um, the subject with a few interviewees. So Shai, do you want to get us started? Yeah, sure. Let me um, share with you our presentation. Just let me know that we're on. Can you see it? We can see it. All right. So to begin with our story today, uh, we would like to talk about the immigration wave, of course, of 1949 to 1953, what really boosted what we can say the immigration wave of Israel, and maybe the best image to start with is gonna be this one. This was taken in May, 1948, in Rothschild's um, street in Tel Aviv, and we can see the independence of Israel, right? The declaration of the independence of Israel, standing in the middle is Mr. David Ben-Gurion, he's the prime minister of Israel, and above his head, we can see pretty much the visionary of the Zionist movement called Theodor Herzl. And from this day and on, Israel exists which means that um, the mass amount of immigration that would come to Israel for the next couple of years can start. Before that, we had a British rule over Palestine slash land of Israel, choose whatever name you want, or both, by the way, um, which means that the Jews can't really enter Israel on a great scale. Now, back in this uh, year, in 1948, we're talking about 600, 650,000 Jews or so. They're the people living here. In the land, we also have about 1.2 million Palestinians. Obviously, the numbers will change when the war would break, but the civil war between the sides, between Israelis and between the Palestinians that's been going on for a couple of months is now pretty much gonna go to the next level. Uh, when other Arab countries are also gonna interfere in the war, the British are gonna leave, and that's giving the cue for many Jews uh, to move into Israel. So when we talk about immigration, First, we can say that Ben-Gurion and his people, which are called the Shuv or the establishment of the Zionist movement at the time, they had plans of bringing mass amount of Jews between 1 million to 2 million Jews already in the 1930s and the 1940s. Zionism is not only a counter movement to the rise of uh, Nazis, Nazism or of anti-Semitism post-World War II. For that, it's a movement that started about 1882 and brought all those Jews to Israel during those years. Ben-Gurion's plan in a way was to bring more Jews from Eastern Europe. That's pretty much where he thought he can use like the bank of bringing Jews at a time. Obviously, after the Holocaust, between six to seven million Jews are slaughtered uh, by the Nazis and um, those who helped them, and the numbers change. And that means that Ben-Gurion and the rest of the national movement, they need to look for other sources in order to bring immigration from. And what they're starting to look at at a time would be Jews around um, North Africa and the close Middle Eastern countries. We call those countries maybe the Islamic world because we're also talking about Turkey and Iran that are not Arab countries um, to begin with. But we are talking about a big wave of migration that would come to the country. And from 650,000, the population is about to double itself within four to five years. It's a massive number to understand. And that would maybe be a part of what we're about to see and talk about during the next hour or so. So those who are coming to um, the ports of Israel at the time, if it's from Earth or from uh, the ships themselves, they're coming to um, be greeted at the port first. And the first thing that we're about to see is this kind of a test of DDT. What happens is that we already have a system in 1948, 1949 to uh, disinfect or to have anything to fight, let's say, typhus at a time and cholera. And this is something that all those coming to Israel, all the Jews, migrants to Israel would have at the time. The issue is that not always there will be an explanation to what is happening. 
And if the establishment at Israel at the time, right, the country that's a couple of days old or weeks old at the time, is mostly Ashkenazi Jewish, meaning the origin of them is from Eastern Europe, that would be the majority. That means they speak even more than Hebrew, they speak Yiddish, which was the language of the Ashkenazi Jews, those who are origin from Eastern Europe at the time. So they'll give an explanation, let's say, to a Jew that came from Romania or to Poland in a language that those could understand. But that not necessarily will be the case with the Jews who are coming from Morocco and Yemen. And if this seems to you like a small thing, I'll tell you that 70 years afterwards, we still hear of great number of Israel from the Muslim world, Jews who came from Muslim countries, who are saying that just being greeted to Israel with this, right, with the um, spring, as a first move, without even saying anything about it, as you're about to go to Israel, that was your Zionist aspiration and dream. And this is the first thing you encounter. That was a real serious thing uh, for them. Hurt their feelings, I mean, will be an understatement, of course, and maybe gave a symbol to what is about to happen during the next couple of years. Um, so after the DDT, of course, they'll be taking all those, all the immigrants, no matter where they came from, they'll be taken to kind of an army camp. What the Zionist movement, or at that point the state of Israel is doing at the time, is to take those army camps and to move them, to transform them into the introduction camps, you can call them, of all those new immigrants. So obviously there's not enough housing or even transit towns to host all of the different migrants, so this would be kind of the first stage. And you can see the images, you see it's pretty much between shacks to tents, and it's a very basic accommodation we can say as a start. Um, here's another one you can see. Now, where are the migrants themselves coming from? So we have a couple of numbers uh, that might help us throughout understanding that. But we can see that we have a separation of those coming from Eastern Europe and uh, Central Europe or Western Europe and between those who are coming from the Middle Eastern countries. So if the highest number we can see from the Middle East, uh, sorry, from um, Eastern Europe is Romania, like my grandparents, they came here in 1948, 1949 from Romania. And then we see also kind of a great Poland as well, and all of us, all, all over, we're talking about 300,000. When we're talking about the Middle Eastern countries, we can see that Iraq is the one providing the biggest amount of Jews uh, moving to Israel due to also pogrom and anti Semitism rise that's happening at the time with over 120,000 that would come within four to five years. And we can see that the Jews are coming from Yemen, or also a massive group. So between these two, we're talking about, or of course, with others, with Morocco, Iran. Uh, India, we're talking about 250,000 or so that are about to move to Israel. Pretty much similar numbers, we can say, between the Ashkenazi Jews and the Sephardic Jews, right? The one who are coming from the Middle Eastern countries. We can also see this kind of separation, right? We can see that Iraq is the one to provide the most Jews. Romania would be the next one. And then we see Poland and Yemen. So it's pretty mixed what's happening within those, let's say, four to five years. What's also happening in 1952, so pretty much two, three years after it starts, is an agreement that is signed between the West German government and between the Israeli government. And this agreement is about to be the reparations agreement. To make a long story short, the Germans apologize for the Holocaust, for everything that has happened between 1939 to 1945. They take ownership of what has happened and they pay twice. They pay for the first time to the government of Israel as an apology, we can say, or reparations right between the sides. And they also pay uh, individual reparations, which means they will go to the survivors of the Holocaust themselves. That means that if you're a Jew living in one of those camps from Romania, from Poland, in 1952, money is going to be sent from the uh, West German, German government to you. And there is a good likelihood that you could leave those camps. So if all of the Jews were brought at once to the camps in 1949, Already in 1952, we see a, a switch with the Ashkenazi Jews, the ones from East Europe, or about 40% of who are making those camps. The percentage in the camps is actually reducing about to be 20% and even lower, which means the majority of the camps are going to be Jews who came from North Africa, Jews came from the Middle East, Iraq, Yemen, and uh, Morocco, Tunisia, Libya, Iran. We talked about those numbers as well. What also is helping to the Ashkenazi Jews is the fact that the establishment is from their group, meaning most people running the show in Israel are Polish Jews, are Romanian Jews, are Russian Jews, which means they kind of feel closer to them and maybe they will get more from the government at the time. 
or maybe they know people in Israel that have been living in the country already for about 30 years or 40 years. So they would try to help and kind of bridge in to um, the newcomers coming from Poland and Romania to get kind of a better housing. And that means that the people that are left behind in the camps themselves are mostly the Sephardic Jews. This is taken from a propaganda movie of um, Israel, very early days of Israel, how the Yemenite Jews are brought up on kind of a magic carpet. This is not a very actual image we can say. People were really put in uh, planes on a huge number without any seat or anything like that, just to be brought uh, to Israel at the time. And when they will arrive to Israel, they will find, I would say, pretty poor way of life. It's not something that anyone imagined before. We're talking about 200 people that are sharing one faucet. We're talking about the family of people, or a couple of families that are living within one tent. Um, nothing that they imagined before. We're talking about the fact that you can't really leave those camps, right? You have to stay inside of them. You can't work outside. You can only work inside if the Israeli government allows you. The camps have barbed wires around them, which is kind of an odd thing to see, especially after Second World War. The Jews brought Jews to Israel and they put them in these kind of camps, um, even if they were giving them food stamps and food and all those things. Still, we're talking about pretty basic accommodation. We can see when the floods would come. I remind you that Tel Aviv provide the same uh, rainfall that London in the UK does. We're talking about an excessive amount of rain here that happens within short days. Then. Um, we would see that to happen. So this is pretty much the life uh, in the camps in the early 50s, and things would take a while before they change. Only after a couple of demonstrations, we can say visits that are um, happening from the leaders of Israel at the time, ministers and different parliament members, they would start to understand that these camps cannot really last, and they will have to move into what we call ma'abara in Hebrew, comes from the word ma'ava, to transfer. Uh, so Mara would be a transfer town or a transit town between the camps and between real homes. So something kind of in the middle of the way. Um, we're talking about the lack of um, quality of life that happened in the camps at the time. We can also talk about um, the medical staff that was there. Very unlikely that you would see a doctor coming every day or every week. So most of the time would be the local nurses that are providing uh, the aid themselves. They will do the job of the doctors when those don't arrive and they would deal with diseases um, that would be on a large scale actually at the camps since um, it's a very crowded area, very difficult to clean. Then if one kid is getting one disease and obviously the whole family and the rest of the kids in the classroom, they would be infected themselves. We need also to talk about what is called the Israeli doctrine, which would be um, kind of a way to educate the people. The idea that Ben-Gurion has at the time is that all those living in the state of Israel should share kind of one view, let's say, or one central view. And that view has way before that, in the 1920s and 30s. It's very socialist. It's very secular. It doesn't really talk about religion. And when Jews are coming from countries that are more traditional and want to pray, then the establishment doesn't see it in a very positive way. Uh, people are getting haircuts when they come to Israel, and a lot of Yemenite Jews actually are talking about how when they arrived to those camps, they were shaved from their sideburns, right, from their payas, from the side of the hair itself. It's a very humiliating, humiliating thing to do to a Jew, but the establishment felt something like we can't allow these kind of very, I don't know, diverse groups to live one another by one another. We need to find something that we can share um, to all of them. So that's also something that we can see here in the camps. And um, the rest, of course, which is the main subject that we have today, I will um, allow the rest of our participants to talk about. Thank you, Shai. Um, I did want to ask you one question before we, uh, we go to our next uh, interviewee. Um, as in Ashkenazi, you mentioned that your family came uh, from Romania. And I know that I mentioned before you're a guide. How do you bring yourself to guide about communities that are not uh, your own, that are, um, I mean, how do you educate yourself? How do you bring stories? How do you connect your travelers to the stories that are not um, your own? Yeah, okay, that's a good question. Um, you know, if I talk only about the Romanian Jewish community that arrived to Israel, then uh, I'm missing out on maybe 98% of what is the Israeli story. 
And the story, I would say, of Israel and Palestine is diversity uh, between the different groups. So what I do with my spare time, I study uh, about anything that I could study, and I try to bring it to the people themselves. I think that coming to Israel uh, and having a tour here would be hearing all those different views and stories because you're not seeing even one thing. I mean, with Mejdi, what we do many times is a dual, is a dual narrative, right? I'll be the Jewish-Israeli guide, and then, of course, we'll have a Palestinian guide as then I'm supposed to provide the Jewish narrative. For me, the Jewish narrative, I mean, there's not one Jewish narrative. It's like, I don't know, between 10 to, to 50. And that's something right. that uh, we're trying to be sensitive, of course, and provide. Yeah. Great, thank you. And I'm sure that also... Yeah, I was gonna say, having, having been on a trip with you, that's absolutely what happens. And we had a, quite a lot of fun talking about these issues, including, including some of the stuff you brought up today. Right. Great, so um, thank you, Shai, and we'll bring in uh, Tom Mehager. Um, Shannon, while Shannon's bringing him in, I'll just say that probably uh, our next interviewees will have additions and thoughts about what Shai was saying, because um, we can all uh, rewrite our own history again and again, especially as, uh, as Jews, everyone has 2,000 opinions. Um, <laughs> but this was just to set the stage. Uh, so hi, Tom. Thank you for joining us uh, today. Um, can you start out with telling us a bit about yourself, uh, your own story, and um, you're the CEO of uh, Amram. Um, tell us about that as well. Hi, good evening, everyone. Masal Khil. Um, my own story, basically, maybe first I start with my family and the place I grew up. And then uh, I'll try to talk how it's made up to be a, politi a political perspective about the Israeli society and about activism. Um, well, from my mother's side, uh, we are from Turkey, from a small city named Urfa. It's Turkey, Lebanon in the border. And they came quite early uh, to Palestine. They came by uh, early uh, 20th century, uh, century 1910. Uh, to Jerusalem. Um, from my father's side, they came, as Shai said, in the, in the bigger mass immigration. Um, they're from the Kurdish city of uh, Zaho, also a small city in Iraq. And they came by uh, the early 50s. And I think now I can say personally that I grew up, I, I, we also felt it when we were young, but definitely I grew up in, uh, in a neighborhood that it's very clear that it was most of us, Mizrahi Jews. Uh, the neighborhood was uh, Gilo. It's actually a settlement. It's over the green line, a bit over the green line, but it's over the green line. It's so-called welfare settlement because mainly the middle lower class were kind of sent over the green line to, to upgrade their housing possibilities as a Mizrahi Jews. And this is where I grew up. Um, and I think as time goes by, I understood myself as a second generation, third generation Mizrahi Jew. Um, back in the reserve army, I uh, refused. I refused to do something in the occupied territories. I was a commander or staff sergeant of a roadblock east of Ramallah. And I was told that the roadblock is for the sake of collective punishment. It was 15, 16 years ago, even more, by 2003. And I refused. And I was sentenced to jail for a few months. And I think as I started to be an activist in the Israeli left, uh, ironically, it was the first time that I, I, I understood myself, I saw myself as a Mizrahi Jew. I felt how the Israeli left, the way we talk about justice and, and the people themselves, the activists themselves, how my own community is not part of this discourse. The way we think about justice, the way we struggle for better society is not part of the so-called left in Israel, meaning human rights organizations, uh, parties, uh, parliament members, uh, media, culture arena, etc. So basically, I might, I might say eight years ago or so, it's when I said, my, I said to myself, wait, something 
something is wrong in the way we talk about justice. And then it's when I kind of went out of my own closet as a Mizrahi Jew to say, okay, I have my own perspective about what it means to be left in Israel. And it's different. Um, while my friends in the left consider the Mizrahi Jews as people who vote in a full consciousness, I, I would say, no, I have to understand, I, I, I can understand my, my community, the way it think otherwise about being, uh, about let's say justice in Israel, Palestine. Um, maybe I would give us a short example about what I do now. As Kim said, um, I'm uh, the general director, the executive general director of uh, Amram Association. Amram is dealing uh, mainly with the affair of kidnapped children of, from Yemenat, Mizrahi, and the Balkan uh, communities. So, it, Kim, maybe in a short, I will explain about uh, the, the affair. 100%, yep. yes. Kidnapped. Yeah. When you hear kidnapping, and I, I'm just assuming here, it, it sounds like who kidnapped them? Did the Palestinians do it? Did the Arabs do it? Did the Jews do it? Who did the kidnapping? I, I explain. I explain. So first of all, I think, I think to, 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 to understand the whole Mizrahi situation and politics here, it's to understand the assumption, the cultural assumption of this elite that Shai described later about the Mizrahi Jews. The whole community was kind of a threat to the, to the Israeli ethos, to the Israeli project as a Western project. Since our families came from um, Arab states, Muslim states, etc., it was a, it was a clear-cut destination of the institution to say that we must not be an Arabs. We must distinguished ourselves from the communities that we came from. Because this is a threat to the whole ethos. Remember the phrase villa in the jungle. Israel is the villa and the whole around place is a jungle. So of course it's racism up until today towards Arabs, but our families also came from those places. So we also now don't, we don't want to be part of the jungle. We need to prove ourselves that we are part of the villa. In the context of of the kidnap, the Yemenat uh, Mizrahi and Balkan kidnapped children. So first of all, if we talk about the cultural assumption, it's very clear that very high rank people from the Jewish agency and from the welfare institutions and, um, and, and a lot of institutions and bodies in Israel, they said that the generation of the parents is bad parents. They don't know how to raise properly their children when it comes to health, when it comes to education, etc. We have a lot of quotes. So let's, let's understand first the assumption of, of villa of the jungle, of parents that can't take care of the children. This is the assumption. And from then, and from this point of view, there is a pattern that we can locate up until today of thousands of children that were taken from their parents and they, were, and they never returned. They were never, never returned. The pattern was that usually the parents were told that the baby should be separated from the family uh, for different reasons. He's sick, you can't be around him, etc. And other, after day, two, three days, the baby is sick without any indication of body, grave, certificates, etc. In many cases, parents said the baby was okay. No one told us that he's sick, that he's about to die, etc. After a day, after 24 hours, he suddenly died. In ages, sometimes in ages of, of a few months, a year or so. And up until today, it's very important to understand that families actually looking from, for the brothers, sisters, uncles, people ask well, what happened with the children. People writing. To the, to the courts, to the Israeli registration administration, to different bodies, people still, and that's what we do actually in our, that's what we are trying to do. First, we are trying to collect testimonies from families about the circumstances of the, let's say, the, the separation and then the kidnap of the children. We take a testimony with all the details, when it, when it happened, 
hospital, etc. We have a, a website which is which a kind of an archive. Ah, you just you just uh, put it in. Uh, and we have a lot of testimonies, and the, the pattern is very clear. It's pattern first because it, it's in different bodies around Israel. It's, it didn't happen only in one institution. And second, because it's not in only, let's say, in a period of time of, or, or of a month or two months, it's mainly during the 50s, but also a bit for, a before and a bit after. So it's a long a years that children were simply disappeared. I, I've heard those stories before, and I'm wondering, I guess, one, it's surprising to me that until now, families can't, through court, be able to get that information. It's, it's mind-boggling. But second, have you had any success in finding people? And if so, what, what was going on? Did the kids grow up believing there were kids of this family that took them, I assume, to raise them, an Ashkenazi family that took them to raise them? Or... What, what exactly happened? Well, first, as to the court, uh, from the point of view of the Israeli institutions, there were certain uh, committees, investigations committees, and they gave answers for the family. But the, the, the answers are very shallow, are very, like, if you open a file, you can see that there is a lot of mistakes. And basically, in most cases, they claim that the, babies, that the baby is dead, but they can't even tell where he was buried, according to their own, their own uh, narrative of what happened. They, they didn't say to most of the families, the baby is buried here for sure, and we can open the grave. And so no certain answers in many cases. Uh, the opposite, there is different, different indications of, let's say, testimonies of uh, nurses that actually saying, that babies uh, were taken out of camps while they were alive and the parents were told that the baby is dead. We have few testimonies. Again, different nurses from different camps. There's no way that they will coordinate between them the story. About what you ask, um, there were few cases. In, in many cases, uh, the children themselves didn't want to to, let's say, uh, discover their own parents. It was too complicated to go out against, if it's against the parents. Um, and also, we, we are not sure. I don't, I, I can't tell, again, give you answers from sure, for sure, because from our point of view, the body that should give an answer is, is the state. I don't know what happened with the children. We, we might also suspect that some children were sent abroad. We might suspect, we have few indications about it. But again, from our point of view, let's say the last adult that hold the children was representations, rep representatives of the Israeli bodies, institutions. Again, welfare, health, etc. That's why Israel should give an answer. And if Israel don't have a proper answer for each family, Israel should um, declare a kind of recognition and apologize uh, toward the community. This is the, to say the least, regardless, uh, you know, uh, taking to court certain people. That's, uh, it looks like that, that won't be the case. But I think that we should talk, we should talk about this affair in a broader sense. Because this is only one affair that reflects the racism towards the Mizrahi Jews. But at the same time, we can talk about tracking in the education system. Again, the assumption, and we have a quote, that Mizrahi young Jews can think abstract. Ashkenazi Jews, people from Europe, think abstract better than Mizrahi Jews. People such as Minister of Education and the General Director of the Israel Education said it. People from the Israel Academy said it. From this assumption, there is a practice of tracking that Mizrahi Jews and other groups are about to be the blue color of the Israeli society. While Ashkenazi Jews going to be sent to be, to study theoretical studies 
that allows you later to go to the university, to the academy, etc., and from there, again, to be part of the Israeli civil society or uh, media or, cu or culture arena, etc., Mizrahi Jews are about to be uh, lower classes, and it's important to understand that it's a kind of mechanism that reproduces itself from a generation to generation. Up until today, there are researches. It's very clear that the tracking, creating gaps between Ashkenazi and Mizrahi Jews, of course, there's other factors as well, but the tracking, the, the racism in its institutionalized way, it's here, it's still here. It's reproduced from a generation to generation. That's those I just gave two affairs in order to understand, in order to explain the Mizrahi uh, struggle, the complicity, etc. Yeah, and just a reminder when we're talking about Mizrahi Jews, like Shai said, we're not talking about five or ten percent of Israel population, we are talking about half of half of the country. That's which... true, as is that's why that's why I would say that it was a threat to the to the to the, to the, to the ethos. Well, because I Mizrahi Jews are, by the 50s, Mizrahi Jews are about to be majority among the Jewish society. And I can see that. I mean, we, we look alike. We look like we could be brothers. So. And we spoke the same language. We so. understood each other's culture perfectly, while somebody who came from Romania didn't. And the only way to be in control was to say, you two should hate each other. And it's ironic because today, Mizrahi Jews and Palestinians are much more against each other than Ashkenazi Jews and Palestinians. So in some ways, the state did succeed in making us think that we don't have anything in common with each other, even though we listen to similar music, we eat similar food, we, we have so much culturally speaking uh, that unite us. We, we today see each other more as enemies than with Ashkenazi Jews, which... which you know, I'm not trying to say we should all unite against Ashkenazi Jews. I'm just saying this division has worked. It has worked. This is one of the main... Uh, Kim, do we have like a few more minutes? Yeah, I'll just say that if anyone has questions for Tom, then feel free to ask them now um, and go ahead. Shortly, shortly, uh, like to, to say something about what Aziz just said. For me, this is one yeah. of the important questions. How come that two communities that used to live together to, for hundreds of years and used to gather, live together quite successfully without making it a romance. It was, let's say it was never a kind of hatred that happened in Europe against Jewish, never here in this, this, uh, this uh, area and the region. How come they became so hostile to each other? And I think there is an interested, interesting uh, researches about the Balfour Declaration back in, in 1917. Uh, the different reaction to the Balfour Declaration, how for, for the, 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 the classic Zionism, the, the Zionism from Europe, it was a success, while the local Jews back then, so-called old, old communities, the, the, the Ashkenazi Jews, them old communities, said Balfour Declaration might be a danger to the way we live together now. So in, in this point and in this area, I think Mizrahi Jews started to say the way Zionism talk about being a collective Jewish people in Palestine and later in Israel, it might be a danger. But then again, I think Mizrahi Jews had to choose. And, and unfortunately, it was a gun on the table if you're keeping your own identity as a Jew Arab, you won't be part of Israeli uh, society. You know, my own father, in Hebrew, you, you also speak with Het and Ein. Like Kif Halak in Arabic, in Hebrew you say Hamesh Vachetzi, Sah? My father didn't talk with me with Het and Ein. With my mother, they talk with Het and Ein. I asked him, yeah. why, why? why? What happened? Why, what are you afraid of? He, wanted, he told me, I wanted you to, to integrate. So the condition to integrate is to give up, even in your own language, to give up the, 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 tiny, the tiny symbol of being an Arab. Yeah, and I. Which is the proper yeah. Hebrew. Hebrew originally was, was pronounced with a het, an ein. 
Yeah, 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 up until now people talk like that. But, but, but in the Israeli elite, in the academy, in the media, people say, ha, ha. They, they, they can't say, say it as, as an Arabs. But what I'm trying to say is that even people that used to re- talk correctly removed it from their own language because they were afraid to be identified as an Arabs. I, I have to admit, I do that sometimes because it helps me so much pass it through Uh, the system and places, and I get compliments all the time. It's like, oh, you talk with a great accent. You don't sound like an Arab at all. So you're <laughs> absolutely right. And, uh, and I can yeah. pass checkpoints without being checked because I avoid saying those letters. Yeah. So it definitely you know, works. You know, Aziz, someone said that identity is a negotiation with the society. So in, in this negotiation, you must give up things, right? You have a negotiation and then you give up your own accent. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. it's a negotiation all the time. Yeah. Well, Tom, thank you very much for, for joining us uh, today. Sure. Uh, fascinating to hear, and I'm sure we have, we have so many more questions for you, but unfortunately, <laughs> we're moving thank forward uh, to the next person. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Sapir, you're on. I think you're just muted. Um, hey. so Sapir is also um, an activist, and uh, we're very glad to have you with us today as well. Um, do you, I see the Haggadah uh, behind you, and I know uh-huh. it's something that we'll, we'll discuss soon. So sure. uh, maybe you can start us off with telling us uh, your personal story and what your uh, main story Um, work is today. Uh, so, Akim and Aziz, thank you for having me. Um, do you want me to start and tell a bit about myself? Okay, um, so my name is Sapir, Sapir Slutsi Omran. Um, I'm 29 years old um, and I live in South Tel Aviv. I'm an activist in the Mizrahi struggles and I guess a lot of struggles that uh, mainly focus on solidarity between communities and, and different uh, uh, struggles uh, since I was 20. And I started to be an activist um, in 2011 when they started in Israel the tent protest. It was supposed to be about the prices of housing and then about different issues in the Israeli community. And I end up being an activist um, and involved in the, um, Um, the tents that were in the uh, periphery of Israel, the social and geographical p- periphery of Israel, especially in uh, Hatikva neighborhood, which is a very diverse um, neighborhood in South Tel Aviv, that usually came, um, um, when people are talking about neighborhood and the news is usually about um, the refugees, the higher percentage of refugees in the neighborhood and the struggles between the communities here. Um, so I, I, I'm originally I'm from Oranit, which is a kind of a, I don't know how to describe it, it's kind of like a bougie settlement. When people came to um, kind of improve, my family came there to improve their lives, um, um, which is, there are some settlements like that, that people didn't came, it's not that they didn't care about the ideology, uh, but they did care about um, improving their life. And this is one of those uh, settlements. And I grew up there as part of a, a family that originally uh, came from uh, Iraq. My grandparents from my mother's side came from Iraq, from Mosul. And so we are very Mizrahi, very uh, Mesotim, uh, Mesotim. And, and originally, uh, most of my family are also right-wing voters and supporters. And, and when I was 20, I started to be involved in activism around issues related to the right of housing and, and public housing. And from then it became very clear to me as soon as I started to uh, kind of engage in more communities, in more struggles, meet some more activists, how these all issues are related. And, and how for me, uh, the issues related to Palestinian rights also, um, discrimination against the, um, 
Ethiopian or uh, 48 Palestinian Syrian Israel, how we like that also to Mizrahi routes, our, our feminist um, struggles are also related. And, and this is when it came clear to me and, and I started to, to be, I wanna say in a process of kind of realizing um, that once you kind of expose yourself to other um, struggles, to other um, inequalities in your society, and you can look the other way and say, this is where I'm taking care and focusing in my community, and this is where it stops. Um, so I think in the last few years, um, I'm trying to focus in my, um, in my activism, in the work that I'm doing as a lawyer. I'm a lawyer and, and working for uh, human rights. I'm trying to focus specific on the communities that are uh, um, less privileged and the communities that are struggling, the communities that kind of like, we can't, uh, don't, don't get the, the most um, um, focus on, on Israeli media and obviously in the mainstream and, and the international media and then also in public and realize and try to understand and organize around those issues to understand how we can support them and work not for them, but with them in kind of a perspective that how, how we can organize of doing um, and pushing justice, but also helping people with charity when needed. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. this is my main focus uh, now, and I guess we'll talk about it a bit more. Yeah, I, I actually, one of the things I saw on your uh, um, bio is mm -hmm. uh, actually one of your photos is you taking photos with the Israeli Black Panther. And mm -hmm. I, I, when we say Black Panther, Americans will think of Black Panthers in America, and it's not mm -hmm. the same thing. It's it's a different, uh, different community. It's not related. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe one, you can briefly explain that, but tell us about who are the Black Panthers in Israel, the Israeli Black Panthers? What, what's, what's their mission? So I think that if you're talking about, just a second, I have a plane crossing here. They're going back straight to um, isolation, so I don't feel very bad about it. Um, so it, it, the part of the, the things that came very clear to me as an activing, activist during those years, that we always also in the Mizrahi struggles, but also in, in different struggles, we always think like, what should we do? And we're starting from the beginning. You know, we always, a lot of people think whether starting activism, they're starting organizing, they're thinking about what should we do? And they're kind of like, I know to say, kind, kind of like bummed out and, and, and feeling very uh, unhopeful about uh, the chances of organizing because they don't, know enough about the history of their own communities, about the failures and how we can learn from them, and also about the successes. And, and for me, if you're talking about, and I will explain about the Israeli Black Panthers, but for me, in, especially in the Mizrahi struggle, we have to learn more, because the narratives, and, and Tom talked about it a bit before me, uh, the narratives that are told, the stories that we are told about um, the struggles of our communities, um, and sorry to say it, but, but some of them are completely bullshit and, and, and are just, um, you know, custom made to, um, to push the, the narratives of the Israeli establishment. Doesn't say that it's true, and doesn't say that it's, that it's something that the, the, the own communities wants to tell to, to their, you know, to their, um, um, next leaders of the community and to the world. So the Israeli Black Panthers, I think that not, not a lot of people know about the Mizrahi struggle, but less of them know that, that during the 70s, since 70, 71, um, there was a community that started um, in uh, Jerusalem, and uh, they started to organize um, to become the Israeli Black Panthers. And that group that became one of the most important, influential, um, grassroots um, movement 
in Israel and since the establishment on Israel in the Mizrahi struggle, but also in all civil, um, civil rights struggles in Israel, um, began from a, a just a small group of young Mizrahim. Um, mainly, most of them were uh, from Moroccan descent, but it was kind of mixed. Um, that kind of bond with the Palestinians in Jerusalem, but also with some uh, leftist radicals um, that kind of told them about the Black Panthers and the civil rights movement in the States. And they were very inspired about those issues. And they started, they didn't, you know, some when we're organizing now, we're saying, okay, okay we're gonna start a movement and then we we're starting to organize. And, and it wasn't like that, they just, they were very um, frustrated from the situation in the neighborhoods. They were living, you know, if people know Kibbutzim, they were living, um, um, the amount of people that was in, in some of the Kibbutzim in Israel, the same uh, uh, number of people was in one building. Um, um, in Jerusalem, in, in some other uh, poverty um, neighborhoods. And they started to organize about the housing situation, about police brutality, um, about uh, not being able to walk because they suffered from discrimination, uh, about not, be able, not being able to, um, to learn in school, only to go to a professional school, not be able to get, a, you know, um, a decent uh, degree. And, and they started with one demonstration um, against uh, um, the mayor of uh, Jerusalem back then, it was in 71. Um, and from that, people asked them, who are you? Like the, the reporters came, you know, and they asked, who is this group that organizing this demonstration? And they said, we don't know, like we're the Black Panthers, the Israeli Black Panthers. And this is how it began. And, and, and people also describe them, like the reporters describe them as, you know, they're acting like the Black Panthers. And so this is how they got their name. And from then they started to become, uh, to become a movement, a grassroots movement that spreaded all over Israel in the neighborhoods and, and became very influential. And they, you can see behind me, um, last year, uh, we issued the Pest of Eragada that the Israeli Black Panthers wrote in 71. And they actually, uh, they didn't have, even had the money for a the typo machine. So they, they stole it from some um, um, in, like Ashkenazi Institute <laughs> and, and and type the the agada and there in in uh, for those of us that knows the pesto for agada they did it exactly at, at the same uh, spirit of the agada they wrote about discrimination and what they need to go through as uh, as mizrahim in israel and they decided to spread it and and kind of like fundraise money through it in their communities um, and invite people to join them to the movement, but also to a um, hunger strike that they did in the Western Wall. Um, they said, okay, we, we're not getting any public um, international attention. We will go to the Western mm -hmm. Wall. And then the police uh, won't uh, you know, uh, uh, beat us because it's like a holy place. And, and the media will come also. Um, and during the years, uh, some of them uh, continued to have some relationship with um, Black Panthers in, in the States, but in all over the world. Um, but this was wow. one of the main, um, really like, I, I think that I just wanna describe how do people talk about it in Israel and the different narratives, just to give an example that um, mm -hmm. when I was taught about the Black Panthers, um, as a as a at school, I think in high school, um, in the um, educational book, they wrote a very small paragraph, and we're talking about again one of the most important uh, um, um, movements, grassroots movements in, in Israel, and and they wrote um, that um, riots based on 
feelings of discrimination. Um, like it, there wasn't a, there wasn't a discrimination. They were feeling depressed. Yeah, they're not even. This is why they the did. Full, yeah, the this is why they did riots. They deserve. They did riots, and um, so right. this is one of the reasons that now some of the things that I'm doing now in the last two years is building an alternative archive to the uh, formal archive uh, in Israel. Um, and this is an activism archive when we do we're documenting and collecting materials from activists about the Mizrahi struggle, about queer struggles, about everything and anything uh, actually. And we're working now on building um, uh, and we need to find this money, but we're working on uh, the, the goal is to build a website that will be free and accessible to everyone. And then we can tell our stories and our narratives by ourselves. We can upload everything so people can see, the world can see, researchers in the academic uh, or, or activists, everyone can see uh, what really happened during um, 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 the history of Israel. And then it's, uh, and, and it's gonna be uh, our way um, in the Mizrahi struggle and about other struggles to tell our story the way we want to tell it and without anyone interfering in our history and shaping it in the way that is, you know, good, from the, good for the Israeli establishment. Right, and um, Sapir, I'll just say that in general, uh, there's no doubt that the Israeli education system is lacking in terms of uh, telling the Mizrahi history. Um, in general, the immigration waves are not really discussed um, all that much except for the maybe the first two Ashkenazi waves. Um, I have to say as someone who studied uh, her MA in emig immigration and social integration that it was the first time I actually learned about all of these and that's a shame. Um, but you also were telling me that uh, you're planning on having the Haggadah in English so that's something uh, to look forward to and um, just because of the time we're going to have to cut you um, a bit short. Uh, but uh, say thank you for joining us today, and I think that you're working on amazing projects and keep up the good work. Um, thank you. Just, so I just want to say to conclude, um, sure. we're planning on issuing the Agada and having some more information um, on the history and also the current uh, information about the Mizrahi struggle uh, with um, Jewish currents uh, to planning to this Passover. And I also want to say that I'm now a part uh, of building a, a Mizrahi feminist movement, and I'm Shavrot Kirot, Breaking Wars, and we're working now on the archive, but also uh, campaigning and organizing communities in related of issues of women and poverty. And I will be very glad if people will want to um, hear from us, connect with us, hear a bit more if you're coming to tours, or if you want to hear some more perspectives about the Israeli society and how the way we see and want to talk about solidarity between struggles, the Mizrahi and uh, the Palestinian, of course, together, uh, we will have to give this information and connect with you. And thank you for having me. Thank you. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Um, and I think we already have the El on with us. Hi, Liel. You're still muted. There we go. How are you? I'm good, and you? Very well. Um, Thank you very for much for the invitation. <laughs> Happy to have you with us. Uh, Liel is a good friend and also a guide. Um, maybe some of our listeners have, uh, have met you here. Um, so let's just jump right into it, Liel. Uh, you said you have a short presentation, or if you want to start with your, uh, with your own story, then uh, you're welcome. Yeah, I thought about... Um, thought about starting with some pictures because um, I must say that when I'm invited to speak about uh, Mizrahi identity or Mizrahi origin, I'm not really feeling comfortable because I didn't identify so much with this uh, throughout my life. And I think it's a part of my family story and uh, of it mainly trying to, in, to move in between East and West. And uh, I think if I'll give this presentation, people understand what, what I mean by it. So I will share screen, would that be okay? No sounds would be good. Absolutely. Good. So 
when we speak about Eastern Jews, we need to really acknowledge the fact that we're speaking also about North Africa. And it's west from here, and uh, my family specifically is from, uh, from Libya. However, I understand this conflict in between East and West because I felt it throughout my life. And in the fact of my family basically in conflict with it themselves in regarding if they are East or West. And this is mainly between those that moved to Italy and those that moved to Israel. Um, but if we think regarding the history, uh, we must say that the history of uh, the Jewish community in Libya is very, very ancient. It's connected to the Babylonian exodus or Assyrian exodus, and then to Roman uh, empire. So we mean thousands of years of, of presence of uh, Jewish community within Libya, having synagogues, uh, having a vibrant community life. Um, it's being said that uh, throughout hundreds of years, Jews were a central part of Libya, a central part of the community. They were the elite. They were the most educated ones. Even the Ottoman Empire, they were those to, to basically um, being a part of the government, the judicial court, and even having their own, uh, their own uh, schools. Um, the Libyan Jewish community is kind of a, a conglomerate of Jews that came uh, thousands of years ago, those that uh, ran away from Spain in the, uh, the end of the 15th century with the Jewish exile from Spain, and those coming directly from Italy in order to make money because it became a center of trade in the, in the Mediterranean. Uh, so we mean that by the beginning of 20th century, you're talking about dozens of thousands of Jews uh, living or in the villages outside of the cities or specifically in the capital. Uh, and in the 20th century, we start seeing a uh, problem that they have. In the beginning, they thought that they are a part of, uh, of Europe. They have the Italian citizenship. They studied in Italian schools. In many aspects, they try to divide themselves from the local Arabs. And it's something that I hear a lot. I heard a lot from my grandfathers that they said that they are not Arabs. Arabs are those that live outside of the city or those living in the streets or those that are not Jewish or Christian. And we are Tarab Lucy, or we are Libyans, or even we are Italians, we are not Arabs. However, Italians themselves eventually in the 1940s uh, made this definition very clear by uh, declaring uh, all Jews from Libya to be uh, sent into death camps. And there is the famous uh, Holocaust stories that came from uh, Benghazi, which was the capital of Libya at the time, directly uh, to the death camp of uh, Bergen-Belsen. And there were hundreds of Jews from Libya uh, being killed. And if we think of North Africa, not like the Jews that come from Arab countries uh, around the Middle East, we see that we have also a very clear Holocaust story engaged in the identity and a trauma that related to the fact of them being a minority within uh, uh, a European colonial uh, country. So immediately after uh, the Second World War, we see two things. We see it's first of all the local, um, the local communities that are not Jews adopting anti-Semite uh, theories and start to have riots against the Jews that are coming back from the death camp and concentration camps. And on the other, we see European countries don't want the Jews to move to their, to their uh, countries. Uh, we see pogroms against the Jewish communities and Jews, the extreme majority of the Jewish people from Libya are moving out, mainly to Israel. However, there were a few thousands of Jews that stayed for different reasons. For example, my immediate family needed to stay in Tripoli because my uncle was sick and he couldn't get on the ship. Um, other families needed to stay because they didn't get the permits from Israel, they didn't get an approval, uh, there was eventually also regulation from the government that uh, one member of the family must stay in, in, in Libya. And because of that, there were around 5,000 of Jews uh, uh, staying there. And something very interesting came up. We see the those coming to Israel, uh, being sent into Ma'abarot, some kind of Israeli Zionist concentration camps from those coming from those countries, poor areas of resettlement, uh, very much in the periphery, uneducated, as Storm and, and Sapir said, and very, very marginalized. Um, however, those that stayed in Tripoli had a very different life. 
I know from my family that those that stayed in Tripoli were educated in Italian school or Western schools. They opened businesses. They became very rich. Libya in general became very rich because of the oil export. They became very famous traders between Italy and Libya. And they became basically the elite of Libya. Very, very educated with a lot of property, very much connected to the government, very much connected to the Mediterranean trade. And furthermore, I know specifically with my family that they received letters from our uncles and aunts telling them not to move to Israel because of the marginalization and poverty that they have in this country. Instead, they made everything they can in order to move slowly their property to Italy and to plan maybe a resettlement uh, in Italy. But in general, throughout the 50s and mainly the 60s, they prefer to stay. However, in 1967, because of the war that happened here in Israel-Palestine, the Jews of Libya had another pogrom. The local government sponsored local gangs that attacked Jewish centers, that uh, they um, entered into the synagogues, they burned it, they entered into houses and burned it, they uh, killed kids, they killed families, and the Jews got uh, an order from the government to leave the country within 48 hours, and they needed to leave all their property uh, at home. As I said earlier, they understood they cannot move to Israel, and it's better that they want to move to Israel, so they moved to Italy. This is the great synagogue of Rome, and its similarity to the great synagogue that was in, in, in Tripoli. But they settled in Rome, many of them, it was a whole neighborhood uh, dedicated to them. And in Italy, in Italy, they became also very successful and educated. Uh, this is my uncle and my aunt. One became a famous singer. The other became a famous professor of psychology. Uh, and they are the two only educated, high educated people in my family. And it's because they moved to Italy. All the rest that moved here, they were not. They were not given the same opportunities. They were not given the same resources. They were not given the same support from the government. And within my family, I can feel strongly this marginalization that is happening here compared with those that move directly to Italy. Um, I wanted to end the presentation with these specific pictures because the, the result of this story is the, the fact that many Jews up until today try on the one hand to understand what is the legacy that they have from these North African countries. And many want to go back uh, if we compare it with the Moroccan uh, Jews, they have the ability to go back with different trips, with now a, a, an ability to ask for citizenship, with recognition of some property rights. However, the Jews of Libya don't get this uh, opportunities. Their property is still uh, kept away. Um, there are millions of dollars being said that need to go back to the, to the community, but no one is recognizing it. And in few incidents, they try to, to smuggle in to Libya in order to find that property, to find tombs of, of, of the older generation. And here, as we can see, even to pray within that those uh, synagogues that left behind and were burnt. Um, on the left, however, we see in 2011, uh, after there was a revolution in Libya and the Jewish Libyans asked for citizenship or an ability to to re-enter to the property they left behind. There were demonstrations in Libya against this right and against Jews being brought back uh, uh, to Libya. So I end ended my presentation, but I must say that um, in comparison with, that, with other uh, Arab Jewish communities, as I like to refer to them, or Arab speaking Jewish communities, the communities of North, North Africa and specifically of Libya have a different uh, story because they suffered from the Holocaust, they suffered from anti-Semitism, and also suffered from um, persecution from the local Arab neighbors. And throughout my life and throughout my childhood, I heard from my father again and again, the fact that uh, we are not Arabs, Arabs are traitors, Arabs are those that you cannot trust. And uh, as I know, as a kid, they can one day just come and uh, organize a program against you. And this is why we need to have a strong uh, country. With this being said, whenever he decided to move here, which is, was in the 1980s, and because he married my mother, and my mother con convinced him to move here, she was Italian, white Jew. 
Um, he immediately saw that uh, he cannot connect with the culture here, with the Ashkenazi people here, and he immediately became very, very active in a Likud right-wing uh, party with the strong identity of Mizrahi that suddenly he adopted for being a, an Italian, for thinking of his, himself as a Western, educated European. Suddenly here in Israel, he was put in a box of being Mizrahi, of being marginalized, of being weaker, of being uneducated, and it didn't matter what he will do. Even uh, my uncle, the one that became professor of psychology in Rome, he wasn't accepted in the Hebrew University to teach because of his background. My aunt as well, she wasn't accepted for studying here because of her background and because of her name. We, when we moved here, we changed our name in order to be integrated from Magnaji to Magen. And for me, because of that, it became easier to show myself as a European Jew instead of Mizrahi Jew. And the fact of how I look and my skin color maybe had also uh, helped me. But uh, I, I saw throughout my life this, uh, this marginalization that is very central and how generation and generation away, it's still a basic part of how Israeli society and Israeli economy uh, is being held and controlled. Um, I, I just add because I remember that Kim asked, it about, uh, asked about it uh, today and it's about what I do today. Um, I'm not active in the Jewish Libyan community. I must say that I don't find myself there. And my father is also not finding himself there because it's held and controlled and led by mostly the Jews that came in the 40s and 50s. And it, we have different stories. Um, however, I'm really involved. It started with working with Aziz here, but with other piece of organizations in trying to promote a, a different regional identity and regional solidarity. And we need to rethink our position in this region as Jews and as Israelis. And I believe we can adopt a Middle Eastern identity that is in solidarity with Palestinians and in solidarity with other Arabs and understanding that this whole region has a story of persecution and exploitation and discrimination. And we can, after adopting this identity, we can eventually build a new system that is based on, on equality and rights. And for doing this, I'm promoting uh, regional dialogue programs and regional coalition building. Uh, and as a part of it, recognition of Jewish stories within the Arab countries. And um, I can tell you more if uh, you'll be interested and you'll approach me directly. Yeah, this is, this is definitely amazing because, again, we, we've been talking about similarities. And I remember when we met, Liel, I don't know if you remember this what, uh, many years ago. And we were in East Jerusalem, and I remember your first time coming to East Jerusalem. Uh, we driving to a pub uh, on the Palestinian side, and you were so excited about about it. You're like, I want to tell everybody, and and this is like a secretive, cool place. I think we can start bringing many Israelis to East Jerusalem, and it was such a a big moment for you to realize there is that community that you can connect with that. You, you weren't aware of before. And that, that was, I think, about what, 12 years, uh, 10 years ago, maybe 11, yeah. 11 years ago. So it's. Yeah, gener generally, I learned Arabic from my Palestinian friends. And I uh, remember the first engagements with Palestinians. I recognized different words because I heard them at home. I just thought it's Tarablusi and not Arabic. I thought it's the Jewish Libyan language and not the Arabic of Palestinians. Um, it's something that uh, eventually today I understand what they are saying in family dinners just because I had a relationship with Palestinians. I, I wouldn't have the same opportunity and my sisters don't know Arabic because they don't have the same relations. It's actually fascinating. I don't know. We don't have time to talk probably about that, but I've met your family, your sisters, and it's been fascinating seeing you've been the first I think among them as an activist. And now you, one of your sisters is becoming, I think even more of an activist than you, which is fascinating seeing her on the internet, seeing her on TV, being like the, uh, the person carrying the, the torch, I don't know how to say it, and being like, we need to make a change here. And it's uplifting for me watching that happening, that it's not just you and it's moving through the family who 
will be coming. I have to tell you, I watch everything your sister puts on because online, because it's fascinating. And um, for those who don't know, if you're following Israeli politics, there are protests happening, people who who are talking about the reality of the situation there, not just Israeli Palestinian, people talking about corruption, people objecting to, to the social structure. And uh, Liel's sister has become one of the people who are extremely active in that. And I know you are, obviously, as well. Thanks, Aziz. I think what's also interesting is that in the different interviews that she brings, she, she, she gives, she brings up this Mizrahi special story, uh, and people are kind of shocked by it. They, she looks kind of like me, and suddenly she gives this Mizrahi story, and people are kind of, they cannot put us in a specific box which is something very, very important regarding the racism or the, the, the stigmas uh, and stereotypes that still exist in Israeli media and public debate. And you know, next week we are talking about from a minority to a movement. And we, we're talking to all Maple Alliance for Middle East Peace and it kind of connects to that because this is, this is a question we all having is how do we turn what we do into a mass movement. And I think bringing the Mizrahi community and not to have the peace movement being the Ishkenazi thing or part of the Ishkenazi thing, but really bringing in the Ethiopians and bringing in the Mizrahis and bringing in the Russians who, you know, all are often seen as the hawkish anti-peace communities. And I, I refuse to believe that's how we should categorize people anyway. I think that's the only way eventually we're going to be able to break through. Yeah, completely. Like, uh, especially now that if we really understand the demographics, Mizrahis are the majority of the Israeli public today, uh, whether right. half, quarter, whatever, like most of Israelis have roots in Arab countries and uh, this needs to become more central in our story as peace camp. Um, 100%. Yeah. And when we were thinking about the show, I mean, I know that our series is talking about minorities, and we know that this is definitely not a minority, but it's a story and a group of stories that is not spoken about enough. Um, and here we're showing what we're talking about next week, as Aziz was saying, uh, peace building in the Middle East. So uh, we hope you joining us, join us next week. And as we always say, Aziz, um, it's not where you travel, but how. Thank you, Liel. Thank you, everyone who joined us, and uh, see you next week. Thanks for the opportunity.